Hello, my name is Dr. Matt Harris, and this is another entry into my series on the six tenets of educational technology leadership. In this particular episode, I'm going to talk about being a professional learner. So up to this point, we've talked about a lot of skills that you need to have in order to be successful. Maybe to get the first job, to be better at your job. Um, we've talked about leadership. We've talked about management. We've talked about understanding about information technology and educational technology. And we've talked about that macro view of systemic thinking. But the, the issue here is that you know, all of those things are skills that you can develop and arguably you can master and, and feel pretty comfortable with. But educational technology, the technology element and the educational element, suggests that our field is always in flux. It's always moving and there are always new things that are happening. And the educational technology leaders that I see out in the field that are doing really well do something very strongly, and that is they have made a commitment to professional learning. They have found a way to connect with other resources of information to improve their practice, which by extension extends what the school can do and the value that they bring to their institution. And so though it seems rather self-serving by saying you need to be a professional learner, that's, that's not true. Um, you need to be a lead learner, the way that we want our principals and our, our heads of schools to be um, learners themselves. You need to do it, and you need to do it in a systematic and a professional approach where you allocate enough time, where you look at specific resources, where you find um, calls to action, and you, and you act upon them. Your skill set needs to be improved in order to be um, a strong element of the community, to be able to take that systemic knowledge and grow the institution further. If you are not continuously moving, you're not going to be able to create an environment that values learning at the level you'd like them to, to, uh, to do. So a few things that I would suggest you do. Number one, create some sort of personal learning plan for yourself. So what, would it, what is it that you would like to accomplish over X period of time? So over a term or a semester, quarter, whatever it is, over an academic year, what are you looking to learn more about? And, and take a very formalized approach to this. Um, think about some outcomes you're looking to have. Thinking about, think about um, sources of knowledge, where you're going to go to learn about these things. And then go about doing that. Allocate time and resources and connect with those sources of knowledge to meet that goal. So maybe you're looking to have a new certificate. Um, maybe you're looking to develop a capacity in a particular technology or um, uh, an area of research that you don't know. Uh, maybe there's something within the school, maybe around innovation or makerspaces, or I don't know, whatever the, the element might be, you would like to become more knowledgeable in that field. Take that on. Make that part of your own professional learning and make it systematized. And you need to stick to it. One of the things that, that we do very much as educational technologists, especially in leadership roles, is that we get so involved and so passionate about particular projects or helping somebody out or, or doing just about anything that the, um, the day slips by, that the calendar gets wiped out because I had to get that one project done for whomever. And everything put, gets put to the side. And what you'll find is that your own professional growth while just as important as all of the other responsibilities you have, will get pushed to the bottom of the priority pile. That, that's no good for the school. It's no good for you because you need to make those connections. You need to make that, you need to have those points of, of connection to sources of knowledge to make you better within your own practice. It's the only way you're going to continue to be of value to your school, let alone taking your school to the next level or to, to improving what they're already looking to do. So beyond that formalized piece, though, I would suggest that you really need to be pretty active in the informal spaces. And it's very easy to say, hey, create a, you know, an hour every three days where I'm reading or studying or creating whatever it is as part of my professional learning. That's wonderful. That's, that's very specific and goal-oriented. But, but one of our major challenges is if we don't have regular assessments like the kids do, we don't know what the next things are that are coming unless we're involved in kind of broader conversations. And so those formalized pieces, which I think are hypercritical, have to be accompanied by a level of informal learning that's pretty regular. So going on to discussions, going on to Twitter, whatever the sources of knowledge, but looking at what are the trends out there that are, are worth cultivating in your, own, in your own experiences. 
So there are a few avenues to do this. Reading articles is incredibly powerful. There are a number of resources out there that I would suggest. Um, reading EdSurge, THE Online, um, eSchool News. There are a few of those that will, will kind of give you a hint about some of the major things coming down the pipeline or may even have connections to people that you want to learn about or learn from even more. That's great. I would suggest that you become very heavily involved in Twitter. Be a person that goes out and finds information from others and then shares it on your own. By doing that, you get snippets of ideas that you can say, you know what, I want to go deeper on that particular topic, and it's something that we can discuss at my school. Um, I am a proponent of connections with people. And connections with people in terms of um, professional learning comes in a lot of ways. Um, you can do this by going to conferences and connecting that way. There are informal networks. They're just sending emails and having discussions with people. If you find an author that you're really resonating with, connect with them. Um, get involved in broader scale organizations because you can connect with those experts. And it's really the best way to get connected with people is to be connected within the same circles that they're connected to. So a lot of people that you want to learn from that have this valuable connection feel really excited about giving out information for free, but they don't want to give out time for free. Time is their most valuable resource, as it is yours as an educational technology leader. So if you have shared time and shared connections and shared activities by doing things within organizations, you're going to get a lot out of that. Um, so again, Twitter, very powerful, connecting directly with people, going to conferences for the people aspect, not necessarily for the content. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. Um, but connecting with others to be able to share ideas. And when you do this, it's really incumbent on you to do it from the frame of exchange, not just taking in. So what is the discussion that we can have about what you're doing at your school or your expertise over here, rather than please tell me everything you know, I just want to take it all in. That doesn't help you learn. That doesn't help you contextualize, and it doesn't give you value in being a continued resource with this person. So make sure that you're engaging with them as you go forward. Um, let's talk about conferences. I, I go to conferences frequently, and they are a lot of value for the people aspect, and then there is some value for the content aspect. But you need to be selective in what you're doing in terms of content. Um, some conferences will vet uh, materials very deeply, and some of them won't. Um, some of them will pay people to come and speak, others won't. What I would suggest you do is Take a real deep look at what's available at the conference prior to your arrival. Plan out your schedule. This is what I do. I actually put it on my calendar and I know where I'm going to go. And I usually give myself two or three options per session block. And say, you know what, this is what I'd like to learn. Look up a little bit on the presenter, so do some, some pre-checking. And then go into each one of these sessions with an open mind but a weary eye. So what is this person talking about? Is this something I can replicate at my school? Is it worth moving forward? Or, and, is this person speaking from a point of expertise and of value or just opinion and something not as valuable? Is there some, some sensationalism to this? If that's true, that may not discount everything you're seeing, but it will taint it. So presentations are done by people that want to give presentations. They want to give their time to these things. Those are not always as valuable as you would hope. So, so go in there knowing that some ideas might be sparked, some passion might be sparked, that you can then take and do these wonderful things. But, but the answer you're looking for for problem X will probably not be in a 45-minute session. But it's a good start. I have had my best experience with those sessions when I go talk to the presenter afterwards, exchange contact details, Twitter cards, email, whatever it is, and then having a discussion later on by Skype or by some other means where we talk about things in depth and I contextualize their materials from my situation and then and search for ways where I can help the other person. So again, that exchange is very, very critical. Um, I talked about organizations. Um, it's very important for me at least to be involved in organizations, to hear how they operate, to give my time to them because I get to see a broader view of what's happening externally to my school through these organizations. So that's always a great, great way of, of doing some strong professional learning. <clears throat> One of the elements that I have found incredibly valuable is um, going on school tours. And the best way for me to go on school tours of other locations is through accreditation. So there are a number of accrediting agencies out there. 
Um, in their international schools world, there are about four or five of them that, um, that have really, really strong reaches around the world. And if you are somebody who's been in a particular school or a field for a while, there's likely a place for you to go um, do a visit to another school. Now, it's a lot of work, but you get to see how another school operates at depth without having ownership over what they're doing, which is super valuable to you because you get to understand all those connections, all that uses of technology, all those innovations that you're hoping to see in practice, in actual practice, without having to commit you know, a two-year contract or a whole bunch of your own money and your own budget. You get to go see that. You make incredible connections and you learn how schools operate from a different lens than your own. Hugely, hugely valuable. Um, we also will host people at our own schools. So having discussions about why we're making decisions with somebody that comes in to have a view to the experiences at your school, kind of like accreditation, engages you in this discussion that's, um, that's really, really valuable. So again, those connections are really powerful of, of things that I would suggest you do. Um, I would post information on your own and you're thinking, how is being a professional learner move forward or progressed if I'm posting information about my own system? Well, I talk about this in another, another vlog post. The only way to truly engage in, the, in a discussion that gives you professional growth as a learner is to offer something to the conversation. The style of lecturing and receiving data, receiving information and knowledge as this kind of empty pail, we know doesn't work in learning. And it's something very much out of, out of vogue within our field. So you should treat the same way, you should treat it the same way with your own professional learning that engagement and creation and contribution are the best ways to get things back for your own professional practice. So write about something you're doing at your school that you'd like to get better on. You don't need to be an expert, but you can spark a conversation that connects you to other people that has that, that allows you to have those really deep conversations. That is what's valuable. Not just you putting something out and talking about yourself. Okay, so look at online materials, have a formalized plan, um, tie your plans into the overall professional learning growth of the school. Have a lot of informal connections because the expertise outside of your school is going to be vast and connecting to that will improve your internal expertise. Um, make those connections and realize that the, that the relational connections to other people are more valuable than any article you're ever going to find. Okay, So I, I kind of want to conclude this by um, making a few provocative statements about learning that maybe will challenge you a little bit, make you think a bit about um, who you are as a professional learner and, and maybe give you a charge to, to go try a, new, a few new things. So I would say as a professional learner, and these actually even apply to me as, a, as an educational technology leader, these are things that I revisit quite often in my own practice. So number one, a majority of your knowledge is outdated. So a majority of the things that you think you know about the field of educational technology, systems, whatever it is, is probably outdated. If that's true, then it's incumbent on you to maintain your job and do your best for your school to further upskill, to learn new things, to try things out. And what I have found is that for most professionals, this is true. Their knowledge is outdated, so they need to upskill. Number two, most schools value external knowledge over internal expertise. And this is really a challenge to you. So I have a doctorate. I've done research on one-to-one -one programs. I go help schools develop data systems and strategic plans. Um, we do school improvements. I, I help build coaching models. I teach teachers. I do all of these sorts of things that many of us do. And yet a person from the outside of my own school can often be valued more than me being an internal expert of my own school. And that's just the culture of education. This is not something that is negative about my school or any school in particular. It's just something that we regularly have to agree to, that some outside consultant, some evaluation of my school is going to be viewed more favorably than my internal opinion based on my knowledge and experience. So if you're doing that, or if you're in this similar situation where external knowledge is more valuable than internal knowledge, you should, for yourself, go figure out who those external pieces of knowledge are to support your position. You need to learn about the field, maybe even bring those people in to have them say, oh yeah, yeah, this person is saying the right thing, this system aligns with what these 25 other schools are doing, and by the way, you're actually doing it even better. 
if somebody says that on the outside versus me saying, I've looked at these 25 other schools and we're doing it better, that external validation for some reason goes further within a school than the internal expertise. Uh, next, you probably haven't thought of something. So I have told you over the series of these tenets of educational technology leadership that you need to be a leader, have a vision and a strategy. You need to be a manager. You need to be able to run processes and policies and people, all sorts of things you need to be in charge of. You have to understand about IT, the complexities of wires and cables and data flows and operational systems and client server models, all of that, how passwords work, external attacks, all of those things you need to understand. I said that you needed to, to understand about educational technology. How does the, the use of tools and the agency given to students change the models of learning that we have? How do you do that within the context of, of high stakes testing at the IB or the AP levels or you know, star testing or any of these other kind of standardized tests? How do you take technology to make learning better and tie learning to non-academic outcomes? I also said that you have to have a knowledge of an entire system. You have to know the forest and the trees of your school and connect them together to be the most effective leader. Do you think you're gonna know all that? Probably not. And so what you're gonna find is there's something you're missing. There is going to be a deficiency, a weakness. And what I would argue, what has been most successful for me is, is identifying those weaknesses, but not dwelling on them. Finding systems, finding resources, finding people that will help support me in growing my strengths and accounting for my weaknesses. But knowing that I don't know everything and that growth in myself internally is going to help my school. And the last thing I'd say, number four, and this is almost a guarantee, you are not allocating enough time to your own professional learning. So Google tried this 20% model where you could try whatever you wanted and it was tough for them. And they were doing that within a multi-billion dollar corporation. I'm guessing you're not giving 20% of your time to your own professional learning. I'm guessing you're not consistently giving effort to your own professional learning, and yet as a leader in building capacity amongst your team and your staff, professional learning is a major part of what you do. You need to give enough to yourself at the same rate. So give enough time and enough effort that you would expect and hope out of your teachers, out of your fellow colleagues. That's critical in order to being a professional learner that will help your school. And again, this is a central tenet of educational technology leadership because we don't know everything. We're growing and the only way to continue to use technology to potential is to stay abreast of best practices, of experts in the field, and growing your own understanding of these things at a continuous rate. Thank you very much.